Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Turn your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35 this morning. We are so close. There are three Sundays left in the study of Luke. As Pastor Andrew said, we've been in this book since uh, September of 2017. Uh, and, and in two weeks, we are going to finish it up, close it out, and move on to another book of the Bible. All right? So Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. This week, I was uh, speaking to a, a former professor of mine at Dallas Baptist University, and I reached out to him uh, for a recommendation that I needed. And we got to talk, and we talked about all kinds of things, motorcycles and, and fishing and, uh, and, and all kinds of things that were not on, on topic with what I needed to talk to him about. But we also talked about preaching. He was my hermeneutics professor, uh, so he's the one that taught me how to open the Bible and apply it to you. So really, you can thank Dr. Uh, Norman Blackaby for how I preach. And maybe that name sounds familiar. His father is Henry Blackaby, who wrote the book that's very popular, Experiencing God. And so uh, I, I reached out to him and, uh, for that recommendation. But we got to talking about preaching and what is it and, and why do we do it and how do we do it. And man, it was just, it was just really uh, wonderful to, to hear another pastor. He's also a pastor of a church. Uh, talk about uh, the love that he has for the Word of God that is so congruent with, with the love that I have for the Word of God. And, and he said, what else would we preach? Exactly. Uh, like, like, what else would I do here if I don't say open your Bible and I don't take you through it? What else would I do? And, and I don't mean to, to speak ill of, of other pastors, but the reality is that right now, this very moment, there are, there are people that call themselves pastors, both men and women, who are opening what they call a sermon, and they are just giving you their own insights into life. They are just pouring out to you uh, their own, their own uh, experiences, their own philosophies. And, you know, listen again, um, each person that, that occupies this place will stand before Jesus. And, 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 you know, so it's not for me to judge. But folks, the, the Word of God is living and active, able to divide between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. I mean, what else do you need for life? than this, right? So turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. And if you don't have one, there's one in the chair in front of you because we want you to open that. We want you to see, right? God's word is powerful. Amen. Someone asked me, what is expository preaching? They saw a post that I, that I posted earlier this week. They said, what is expository preaching? Uh, this is expository preaching, opening the Bible saying what it says, what it means, giving the sense, applying it to life. That's expository preaching. Okay, so let's do some expository preaching this morning, shall we? Yes. All right, Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 35. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further. Let me pause here for anyone that wasn't here last week. Last week, uh, in the passage before this, Jesus encounters two disciples on the road to Emmaus, a seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they're walking along. They don't recognize Jesus, but he opens for them the Scripture. He goes through Moses and the prophets and all the Scriptures and relates to, to uh, he, he takes that and applies it to himself because all Scripture points to Jesus. And so here they are, they're on the road. As they drew near to the village to which they were going, he acted as, as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They, they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay, let's, let's pray, and now we'll jump in verse by verse. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, it is indeed a treasure to us and I pray that you help us mine it, help us to go deep into it and pull out the gold that's there 
And I pray, Lord, that you bless your servant as I try to expound upon it, try to explain it, try to apply it. I pray that you give me the help that I need. And I pray that you would tune our hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would cause our hearts to uh, be on fire for you as the scripture is opened to us this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 28 and 29, they drew near to the village, so they were getting near to Emmaus, and he acted as if he was going further. Now, uh, we don't know if he was just pretending or or what was going on. Jesus was a busy man. He had places to be, people to see, and so, uh, so he may have kept going had they not invited him, had they not strongly urged him, saying, stay with us for the day is now far spent. So it may be that they were afraid uh, of their guests who they were obviously drawn to uh, of his traveling at night. I mean, when you're traveling a dark road in the countryside, it's dangerous, right? There's danger from robbers. There's danger from wild animals. There's all kinds of dangers that they could have faced. But the reality is we don't know exactly why they insisted that Jesus stay with them. All we know is that, that they got the privilege, what Norval Gelden Hughes calls the inexpressible privilege of hosting the risen Lord Jesus. Why? Because they wanted to be hospitable. Perhaps they didn't even know what it was that was stirring in their hearts. They, they felt something. We're going to see in just a second that their hearts were on fire, that they were burning. Something about Jesus was different and unusual, and they wanted to know more. So they opened their home to Jesus, or at least one of them opened his home towards, uh, to Jesus. Now, again, we don't know exactly why they did it, but Luke records it for us, right? Luke is recording a narrative for other people who weren't there, who didn't see this. And what's the point? What do we make of this? Well, Robert Stein says that Jesus gave the opportunity to practice hospitality to a herald of the gospel. Jesus provided the opportunity to these disciples to open their home to a herald of the gospel. Perhaps Luke intended to show the blessing of hospitality. Perhaps Luke intended to affirm the high calling of the Christian virtue of hospitality. Do you know that Christians are exhorted to be hospitable? Do you know that that you as a believer are called to show hospitality, that you are called to love strangers and use what you have been given for their good? 1 Peter 4, 9 says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. What does grumbling imply? That there's probably going to be a cost, that there's probably going to be sacrifice. Kelly and I call it the cost of hospitality. When we host a connect group and one of the kids knocks over a lamp and breaks the shade, you know what we call that? The cost of hospitality. Look, if you love your stuff more than you love people, then maybe that's an idolatry issue, amen? There's nothing in my house that you can break that will cause me to not love you, right? Now, look, if it's my TV, you and I may have to talk about how, we get, <laughs> how do we get some compensation? How do we, what, what does right look like here? But I'm not going to not love you over it, right? And who knows, the Lord may say, hey, it's a season for you to not have a TV. I, I don't know. <laughs> but look, use it, hospitality is an opportunity Listen, for you to use your stuff for the glory of God, right? Look at what Romans 15, 7 says. He says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Part of your hospitality, part of opening your home, part of standing in the fireside room, part of of, of meeting people that you don't know in here, right? Here's planting a seed for people to to be hospitable here as well as out in your home and in the community. Part of making people feel welcome is the glory of God. Did you know that your living room and your dining room table can be used for the glory of God? And if it can be, what a shame for it not to be. Amen? Right? Use your stuff. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Maybe Luke adds this detail to to affirm for us the Christian virtue of hospitality. It always strikes me that one of the qualifications of 
elders just before the ability to teach. The ability to teach is kind of a big deal for elders, right? Just before that is the qualification hospitable. Why? Because elders got to practice what we preach. And if Christians are called to be hospitable, then elders should be practicing and modeling hospitality. And it's not just for elders to be hospitable. We set an example. Why? So that the congregation follows. If elders ought to be hospitable, then congregation, you ought to follow our example, right? How can you open your home? How can you use what you have for the good of others and the glory of God? All right, verse 30. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Now, there's a similar pattern here to the feeding of the 5,000 and the Lord's Supper. Do you see that? Okay, he, he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave the bread. The same pattern happens with the feeding of the 5,000 and with the Lord's Supper. Now, is this the Lord's Supper? Scholars debate, biblical scholars debate wildly whether this is the Lord's Supper, whether we should see it or not. Now, one thing that we notice is that, the, is that there, there is no wine. And where there's communion, there's wine. There's wine and there's bread. There is no communion here. I mean, excuse me, there is no wine here. And, and I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Luke twenty two eighteen. 18. He says, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. So he's already said that. He knows he's not going to taste wine until the kingdom of God comes. So of course there's no, there's no wine here. But I think that, that, that there's enough similarity for us to see and, and to pick up on the theme of the breaking of bread. Now, remember that these two are not, or you may not remember, but, but I'll tell you that these two were not part of the upper room Lord's Supper. We know that because in verse 33, it says that they found the 11, okay? And then Judas makes the 12, right? So the 11 are exclusive of these, these, these two people, these two disciples were not part of the 11 or the 12 that were in the upper room. So they have no context of the Lord's Supper yet. They, they don't know that the Lord's Supper, that communion is bread and wine. All they know is Jesus is breaking bread for them right now. And that God used the breaking of the bread to reveal to them who Jesus was. Verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Okay, their eyes were open and they recognized him. That word recognize is a derivative of a word used in 1-4 where Luke says that I want you to know with certainty. To know with certainty. The, the same Greek word is used, a derivative of the same Greek word is used to recognize. So in other words, it became clear, it became obvious who Jesus was when? When he broke the bread. And so I think that Luke meant to connect this breaking of bread with knowing with certainty. This breaking of bread with knowing with certainty or, or recognizing, being, uh, being clear, being uh, 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 convinced that Jesus is who he is. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that as we observe communion, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. So, so the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine is meant to be a testimony to people of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we do it, to testify. So what is a church? What is a church? A church is a body that preaches the Bible, that baptizes people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and observes communion. That's a church. Right? And the church, both the baptism, I love you, Pastor Matt, thank you for, for taking that time and explaining exactly what baptism is. It is a testimony of the, of the power of God at work in the souls of his people. And it is, a, it is a proclamation that I have faith in Jesus Christ. I have faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. The same is true of communion. It is a testimony and, and therefore, because of that, Augustine, as quoted by Phil Riken in his commentary, Augustine says, no one should doubt 
that his being recognized in the breaking of bread is the sacrament which brings us together in recognizing him. So Augustine, one of the founding fathers of the church, believes that this is the, that this is the sacrament of communion, that, that that's what we should see, that that's what Luke wants us to see, that the breaking of bread has the power of, of revealing Jesus to people, right? That's why we ought to make a habit. That's why when we gather, we should observe communion, and we should allow non-believers to observe and see, because who knows that maybe one day when we're breaking the bread and drinking the cup, that their eyes will also be opened, and they will see Jesus for who he is. Now, and he vanished from their sight. As soon as they recognized him, he vanished from their sight. So Jesus had a physical body that was capable of walking a long distance, seven miles, had the capacity to, uh, to eat or at least to handle bread, and we know that he also ate later. Uh, he ate fish with the disciples, or at least he cooked them. I, I can't say for certain that he ate some, but he cooked it. So he had the ability. He, he was material. He was physical, and yet he was also supernatural. His glorified body was able to simply vanish. And I think that Luke wants us to see the continuity between Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus in the flesh, the man that walked and ate and talked and slept and the one that was nailed on the tree and the one that had scars in his hands is also the one who currently reigns as sovereign king over the universe. He, he is the same man. Verse 32, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? They could tell that someone special, someone unusual was among them, but they didn't know what was happening. Have you ever had that sense? Have you ever had a sense of something is happening, but I don't know exactly what it is? Their hearts burned within them. The, the, the modern day uh, uh, equivalent of their hearts burned within them is, is lighting a fire under someone. Right? It motivated, it stirred up within them. It caused a zeal to rise in them. And so even before they recognized Jesus with their eyes, the word of God was moving them, was convicting them, was giving them zeal and passion, was convincing them of the resurrection. See, Jesus appealed to Moses and the prophets and the rest of scriptures to point to how they said he was going to die and be buried and raised on the third day because they were struggling to believe that Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified and now it's the third day and all hope is lost. And Jesus goes back to scripture and says, no, all of this was predicted this happened exactly the way that God said it would through his prophets and through Moses. Their hearts were burning within them as he opened the scriptures. What does it mean to open scriptures? Brother and sister, it does not mean to open a Bible and lay it on a pulpit and walk away from it and to lift out a, out a verse out of context and to build a 45-minute or a 34-minute or a 12-minute. Listen, taking one text, taking one text out of Scripture. I, I, heard a, I heard a pastor like, listen, again, I'm not trying to judge. I'm just trying to teach. That's all I'm trying to do. I want you to know why we do this and why this is what you ought to expect. I heard a pastor preach for 30 minutes, and he quoted one verse of Scripture, and he took it out of context. Brother and sister, that, that is... It, we are sheep, there are wolves in sheep clothing. Okay, and we have to be careful, right? If, if I don't do this, then I'm not doing anything for you, right? They, 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 their hearts were burning within them while he talked to them on the road, while he opened to them the scriptures. What does it mean to open the scriptures? What's implied there? If Jesus did it, then what's implied is that he did it correctly, there's a right way and a wrong way to go to Scripture and to open Scripture. Jesus must have done it the right way, amen? So it implies when the, he opened Scripture to them that he gave the right sense, that he correctly interpreted to them what the Bible says and what it means. And it was very relevant. 
He goes to Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, and he says all of that is about what you're experiencing today, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is a right way and a wrong way to approach Scripture. There's a right way and wrong way for you to approach Scripture. Do you realize that you can take Scripture out of context? Don't do it. All right? All Scripture has a context, and context is important. Leon Morris says that Jesus gave them the hidden meaning of the Scriptures, and they responded with hearts on fire. Standing directly below me, right here, if we were to lift up the carpet if we were to cut a hole in the wood, Dane, we're not going to do that. Chuck, we're not going to do that. But if we did, you would see Nehemiah 8.8 8 written in Sharpie marker. Right there, I did it. Right there, because Wildwood, my hope and my desire for you and my desire for the rest of my ministry, if that's 40 years, Lord willing, here in this pulpit, my desire is what happened in Nehemiah 8.8 8 happens right here. Nehemiah 8.8, 8. they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That is my hope and my heart for the rest of my ministry. As long as God calls me to preach, that is what I hope to do, Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And, as long, and even if the Lord moves me away from here, what I hope and pray is that Wildwood stays committed to expecting their pastors to open the Bible, to read it clearly, to give the sense so that the people understand the reading of the word. Amen? Amen. And church, and. See, I can only control my heart. I can only affect me. You have a part in this as well. Here's how the people responded in Nehemiah 8:12. And all the people went their way to eat and drink. Pause. Go get lunch after church. Praise the Lord to the glory of God. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing. Why? Not because the pastor finally ran out of words. Why? Because they understood the words that were declared to them. They rejoiced. They were excited because they walked out of the doors and they understood the word of God. What a great privilege that we have the word of God and that we can understand what it says. Amen? Amen. Church, that's my hope for you, is that when you leave every Sunday, that you go out rejoicing. That you go out rejoicing that you have understood what the Word of God says. Not that I have filled you with, with, with a lot of uh, warm fuzzies. Sometimes you're going to be walking out convicted, just like I do. But you're going to rejoice because now you understand what the Word of God says. That is my heart, my hope, my desire for Wildwood Church and for myself for the rest of my life. Praise the Lord. Glory be to God. Amen. Verse 34, 33 and 34, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. I guess that's where we get, he has risen indeed, huh? Let's practice. He has risen. All right, so that's where we get it right there, verse 34, in case you wondered where that came from. Now, it says they rose that same hour. That's a general time frame. They didn't have clocks. They didn't have watches. That's a general time frame. It means fairly soon or right away. And I want you to note that if it means right away, if what Luke is saying is that they got up right away and went back on their way to Emmaus, they were concerned about traveling at night and concerned anymore. Now their hearts are on fire, and they've got a message that isn't going to be stopped because of danger. Amen? They're not afraid of what might happen to them on their journey back to Jerusalem, on their journey to proclaim the gospel. They're not going to worry about their own safety. They're not going to worry about their own welfare. They're not going to sleep it off, wait till sunrise. They're going to go now. Why? Because their hearts are on fire and they got to tell somebody that Jesus Christ is risen indeed. That's the gospel. Remember that on the way to Emmaus, they were sad. Jesus came up, said, hey, what are you guys talking about? Are you the only one that doesn't know? He says, yes, what's going on? And they stood there sad, Luke says. 
They stood there sad. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were hopeless. And now their hearts are on fire and they've got a message of the risen Jesus Christ and it is driving them. It is compelling them to go and tell somebody about it. When was the last time, brother and sister, that you felt compelled to tell somebody that Jesus has risen from the dead? When was the last time that you felt compelled? When was the last time that your heart was on fire for Jesus? They found the 11, which tells us that these two are not apostles. These are ordinary disciples. Let's note that. Let's tuck that away. The, the, these two people who are walking down the road to Emmaus, who got a private dinner with Jesus Christ, who went and found the 11, who went and found the apostles, that these are ordinary men and women just like you and me. We only know one name, and we don't know anything else about that man. Obscure. Most of us in this room will die obscure deaths. Few people will know our names, and that's okay, because we have a gospel to proclaim to people all around us. And these people that we don't know their names impacted eternity and continue to impact eternity 2,000 years later. If Jesus delays another 2,000 years, will, impact, will eternity be impacted by your life? I'm here to tell you that it could be if you want it to be. Now, this is a little bit confusing. When I first read this, I thought they, the two, were saying the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And I thought, where is Simon? What, who, where did this come from? But in actuality, they go and find the 11, and the 11 have been gathered together with those that were with them, and they were saying, they were saying to the two, so the two go back to Jerusalem with an important message, with a proclamation of the gospel, and their proclamation is interrupted by another proclamation. Jesus is risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon. He's appeared to Peter. Talk about some excitement in the room, some palpability of excitement in the room. They burst into the room. Man, you're not going to believe this. Hold up. Jesus is risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Yeah, that's what we were going to say. <laughs> Can you imagine the intensity in that room that day, that night? It's Sunday night. Jesus is dead and buried on Friday night. By Sunday night, Jesus has appeared both in Jerusalem and in Emmaus to his disciples. He's appeared to Cephas, uh, well, we're going to see this in a second, but Cephas, Simon, Peter, three names, same person. We don't get the details of Jesus' private meeting with Peter. However, we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 4 and 5, that this was ingrained in the church. This truth was passed down to the church, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Okay, so Jesus is starting to make himself known, reveal himself to his disciples Sunday evening. They burst into the, into the room. They've got this exciting information, and they're met with another proclamation. Yes, what you saw is right. Point of order. You open the Bible, and you get this fresh revelation. You ought to run that by somebody. Make sure that you're not the only person who, have ever, who has ever received the word that way, right? They were affirmed. It wasn't just them. They went back. All the, uh, the, the apostles that had gathered together, Simon could affirm, yes, Jesus is in fact risen from the dead. I've seen him with my own eyes. All right, verse 35. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. All right, so on the road, what happened on the road? What happened to them on the road. Jesus expounded to them the scriptures that pointed to himself, right? He, he carefully walks through. He's got a seven-mile road, seven-mile journey. How long does it take you to walk seven miles? Right, quite a while, maybe hours, I'm sure, right? So, so he's got hours to expound Moses and the prophets and the rest of the scriptures about 
about himself and how they point to him on the road. Now, notice that Luke repeats, he repeats himself, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. He repeats for effect. He repeats for emphasis. Why does he do that? Here's why I believe he does that. The readers of his narrative are asked to believe in a man that they have never seen. The readers of his narrative are asked to love a man, a man whom their eyes have never beheld. Just as these disciples, eyes are opened to Jesus Christ through the opening of Scripture and the breaking of bread, brother and sister, you also can see Jesus, maybe not with your eyes, but with your heart, that you can come to recognize, to be fully convinced of who Jesus is, that you will know with certainty the things that you have been taught about Jesus. When the Scripture is open for you, when it's read, when it's explained, when it's applied, and when the bread is broken, today, the Word of God is opened for you, Today, the bread will be broken. And as a bonus today, people have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you need your eyes opened today? Do you see Jesus and do you love him? The Lord's Supper, according to Phil Riken, presents to our senses what God declares in his word. Isn't it interesting that, that Jesus gives us something tangible, something we can hold and taste as, a, as an affirmation, as, as an experience of our relationship with him? I mean, he didn't have to institute the Lord's Supper. He left his word. He left his Holy Spirit. That's enough. But he leaves the Lord's Supper. He leaves something you can taste and something you can hold, something you can experience. Now, before they could see Jesus, before they knew who he was, they sensed something about him. It says that their hearts burned within us. Before their eyes were opened, before they became uh, convinced of who this was, how is that possible? Well, in John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. These disciples knew the voice of their shepherd. Even if they couldn't recognize him with their eyes, they sensed something in their spirit. Brother and sister, we don't get the audible voice of Jesus. What do we get? We get the same thing that, this, that the disciples have always gotten, the scriptures, the word of God. Even if all we had was the Old Testament, we would still be able to discern Jesus Christ. That's what he went to, to explain to these disciples, and it caused their hearts to be set ablaze. My sheep know my voice. And so I think that these disciples, they, they, they felt this is something about him is recognizable. They're drawn to him even before they recognize him with their eyes. Their hearts were on fire. The people listening to Nehemiah and Ezra open the scripture, they left rejoicing, they left passionate, they left excited to be able to know the Word of God. That's how they responded to the opening of Scriptures. My sheep will know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. When God's Word is opened faithfully, and I'm doing my best, and I get it wrong sometimes, 
And when I do, I have to come up and say, you know, I got it wrong. I'm sorry for that. When, God is, when God's word is open faithfully, does your heart get set on fire? Does your heart burn within you at the sound of your master's voice, not mine, his through his word? Does that cause something to stir within you, even if you can't quite put your thumb on it? Is that your approach to the word of God? And you know, it doesn't only happen here. It also happens when you go to your place in your home and you open scripture and you pray and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand his word. You know, I always like to draw the the obvious here that the the one who inspired scripture, all scripture is God-breathed, right? All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit And everyone in Christ has the Spirit of God in them. Connect the dots. The author of the Word dwells in you. The Holy Spirit, who inspired His Word, dwells within the life of a believer. Do you ask Him to help you understand and to see Jesus from the text? Help me to understand. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for correcting, rebuking, instructing training in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. First Tim- 2 Timothy 3, 16, I think, and 17. Is that your approach to the word of God? Holy Spirit, help me hear your voice as I read your word. Tune my heart. Prune my heart. Set my heart on fire with zeal for the gospel. When you come here, you know what to, ex- what to expect. You know I'm going to spit. So stay out of the splash zone. No one, no one sits here except my wife. You know I'm going to get loud. And you know I'm going to start by saying, open your Bibles. So do you come ready to open your Bibles? Or do you come cynical? Do you come Apathetic? Do you come expectant of hearing your master's voice through his word, pricking your heart in in an area that you need specifically for today? I don't know what you're going through, and you don't know what I'm going through. What I know is that there are trials and tribulations in the world, but take heart that Jesus has overcome the world. We know that we're going to walk through some deep, dark valleys And thank the Lord, we're going to have some hilltops as well. I hope and I pray that Sunday mornings represent a hilltop celebration for you because the Bible is open, it's read, it's explained, and hopefully, Lord willing, if I've done my job, then you have understanding. But sometimes sin and pride keep us from hearing the Word of God. Sometimes sin and pride cause us to not be able to see to not be able to sense, to feel disconnected, to feel apathetic. What do we do with sin and pride? We repent of it. Brother and sister, if, you, if this is not true of you, if your heart doesn't get set ablaze when the word of God is open, something is wrong. Something is wrong. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Are you hearing his voice even this morning calling out to you, drawing you to himself, saying, come, draw near. We've covered that the last couple of weeks. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If you feel detached, if you feel distant, if you feel apathetic rather than zealous, draw near to God. Do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. Interesting that in verse 34, it says, the Lord has risen indeed. That word is kyrios, kyrios. It tells us that Jesus is not only alive, but that he is authority. That tells us that he's not just a man, but that he is Lord. 
It's interesting that Jesus defies the norms of hospitality. Norms that we even experience today. If you invite me to your home, who serves the bread? You do. The host does. And that was certainly the tradition of the Jewish people. You invite someone into your home for a meal, you break the bread. You serve the bread. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes in as an invited guest, and he's just going to go ahead and take his place as Lord of that home. My question to you, is Jesus Lord of your home? Where Jesus comes into a home, he's not just a guest. Where Jesus enters a person's life, he's not just a guest. He is Lord or he is nothing. If he's not Lord of your life, he's not Lord of the universe. You can't say Lord. If he's not Lord of your home, he's not Lord of your bedroom, not Lord of your entertainment, not Lord of you on your job. Wherever Jesus goes, he's Lord there. Amen? Is he curious of your life? Does he have authority in your home? Romans 10, 9, Pastor Matt, once again, same page here. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is not intellectual assent. Yes, I concur that a man named Jesus died on a cross and on the third day rose. No, the Lord, the Lord was raised on the third day, and he is risen indeed, and he reigns now sovereign over the nations, and he reigns over the home and in the home of everyone that calls themselves a disciple of his. Do you need to be set on fire by the word of God? Does your heart burn within you at the proclamation of the Word of God? And is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? This morning, I want you to examine yourself as we invite the worship team to come back. I'm going to read for for you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Okay, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. I think what Paul is trying to say here, and there's a lot of debate about it, but I think that what Paul is trying to say is recognize that this isn't just wine and it isn't just bread, right? It's symbolic, of the broken body and the blood of Jesus poured out for you. So examine yourself when you take communion. Do you recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you need to have your heart set on fire, then what a day to do that. Ask the Lord to breathe new life into your spiritual life, to breathe zeal and passion into your life, that you would be drawn to the Word of God. Amen? Father, we thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You began a good work, you will complete it. Help us now to grow in our obedience to Jesus, in our love for Jesus in our zeal and passion. Jesus Christ, the Lord, is risen indeed. That is a message that you have sent us out into the world to proclaim with boldness, with courage, with love. And Jesus, set our hearts on fire. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. 
And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.